and that they feel obligated to answer. I'm going to go live in 10 minutes-ish, so everybody grab your pizza. Oh, good, okay. I have time. And we can uh, do some introductions and whatnot. Most people, all people, 100% of people that you recognize other than you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep, yep. Where did I... So this is, like, I can never get a beat on these things. I thought this one, room's going to be packed. We're going to have to be, like, you know, standing room only, which it's not a bad turnout by any means. I see end of summer. So I, that's where I'm oh, school well, starting. School starting, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. It just, it's, it's just, rain. to me, whether or not there's a big crowd or a small crowd or whatever, it just seems completely random. And it may be. It may be just environmental factors. With the sample size so small, it could be 100% noise. Could. I was on the street last time. And we ran out of space. We got that bigger room that we can move into. Come, no, no. Can we try it? Is that a buffalo pizza? It's not that spicy. That's not why I don't like the thing. Don't hate me. Are we having a fight right now? <laughs> you are. I'm, I'm not. I'm good. I think if I'm having a fight, you're having a fight too. <laughs> Maybe that's how that works. <laughs> that might be how that works. <laughs> also it works in reverse, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No? You sure? Yeah. I'm just sad you guys don't have beer on tap. It's like it's Utah or something. Yeah. Mm. There might be strong state independent reasons not to have that to replace. But you. you you're my nemesis. What That's typically you? true. What? What? In what way? You took the best pizza. Normally, I reserve that for myself. <laughs> what? Which one's that? The buffalo. buffalo. The one he's finishing right now. Which one's that? That he just felt in his crust with. <laughs> <laughs> I took the small piece. Ig ignore the the barbecue edge. To it that it signifies that this was the last piece too. Uh, that was definitely him. If it's any consolation, on my margarita pizza, I have an edge of something vaguely vegetarian, and I'm offended because mm. I'm going to have to eat that. Yeah, vegetables give me indigestion. Doesn't the buffalo have like celery on it? Yes. Yeah. I've built up a resistance to it. Mm. <laughs> but, okay. If you use your meat to grind down the vegetables, it actually digests pretty well, but you've got to have some meat in your craw to do that. Yes, you understood that reference. Mm -hmm. What? Hold on. What is that, 94? What was that? It was an old movie, animated film, called Flight of the, Dra the Flight of Dragons. It was from a crazy defunct studio, half of which was uh, what, half of which was what later became half of Studio Ghibli, actually, mm. interestingly enough. But it is purely an American production. They made the old Hobbit movie. Yeah, they made the old oh. animated Hobbit yeah. film. Same studio. They also did a uh, Return of the King, but none of the, none of the other films. The Last Unicorn. The Last Unicorn. They did the Last no, Unicorn. They didn't do Return of the King. They did the. They did. They did yeah, a Return sure. of the King. They have, they have, there are two there are Tolkien two. animated films. The one's Hobbit. One's The Return of the King. They're both American animation studios. The same one that did Last Unicorn. The same one that did Flight of Dragons. I don't think I don't think I realized that they did Return of the King. They all have amazing, huh. like, 
unique quality for their time. Yeah. They all have great stories. They're lovable characters. They're fun. They all have pacing issues at the wazoo, including Last, Last Unicorn. Like, it's just like, we have this set piece. Look at it for a while. <laughs> it's like, this is not what we're here for. We didn't want to animate anything else, okay? Just work with us here. <laughs> so, yeah, they went out of business. If you have kids, I do highly, really, highly recommend it. It's, it's a great family film. It's at least enjoyable enough to like. So you, you highly recommend having kids or the film? I mean, I highly recommend both, unless you think that your genes don't add to the human race. In which case, just stay out of it. It's fine. <laughs> what was the name of the movie? The, first one the Flight of Dragons. The Flight of Dragons. Mm -hmm. That is like some old '90s kid cult it. nerd classic. Oh, are you for real? I don't like it. You don't like it. Uh huh. It was one of those movies. You don't like it, or you did? I did not. I I don't like it now, and I didn't like it at the time. I didn't like the the the, the studio in general. He doesn't like the art style. It's 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 the art style was okay. It's, it's a little different. It was one of those movies where I was like, okay, fine, I'll watch it. How do you feel when I say the words, Schmendrick the Magician? I don't know what you uh, just said. Get uh, out. Okay. I was like, choose your words wisely. Walk home in shame. Before they meet you. It's from the last unicorn. I'm so glad we didn't bring your car so you have to walk home the hard way. All right, and on that note, <laughs> I'm going to post into the Stack.js channel here. All right. So if anybody wants to re 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 do the X thing. <clears throat> I don't even know what it's called anymore. I do want some help the Canadian, though. I'm still, I'm still waiting to see. I'm not 100% sure that this is not just a long-lived joke. <laughs> because, I mean, it's Elon. <clears throat> So if anyone wants to retweet that to their constituency. Is it so called retweeting? If anyone wants to re-X that. Re-X. Re-X. This is the uh, one. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'm prepared whenever. All right. Well, I'm in two minutes. Repost. Call it repost. Boring. Uh, re true. Re true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to re shoot that on X. <laughs> the thing that I really do love, though, is that we can all make fun of it as much as we want. We're still going to use it. I don't use it. You yes, haven't used it. I was going to say, you didn't use it before. Yeah. <laughs> I barely use it now. I am glad that they expanded the character count because I would have never responded to you if I couldn't do an effort post. It's just like this is not the appropriate medium for for discussing this, I guess. But it was better when I could do several paragraphs. You could have, you could have written it in the notes app and then just screenshot that and then sent that. The yeah. old way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then if you need a screen reader to handle it if you're on an Apple, no problem. Or gone all the way to like TweetDeck or something, which is now dead. All right, everything's sad. She's sexy. Uh, wait, I see one face that might be new. No, I, no, I, I know you. Never mind. Right? Don't I? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen you before. Okay. All right. Sure. <laughs> How do you I not know, know Casey? Huh? How do you not know Casey? I don't come to the JS meetups that often. That's, I mean, that's fine. Did you go to the Rust meetup at all? Once AJ's twice. pretty ubiquitous, and you're pretty ubiquitous, so I'm just surprised. <laughs> Next month, the Rust meetup and this meetup are going to be on the same night. What? Well, what are we going to do? It's going to be in the same building. We have to decide which group to do. One, one, two, and one leaves. <laughs> two meetups enter, one meetup leaves. One meetup presents.
I'm okay with that. He's gonna, have to, he's gonna have to just like constantly go to the bathroom. Uh, sorry, I got a dentist appointment. Another one. All right. So we can do. Let's just do real quick before we get started. Uh, I want to do a quick round of introductions. Just say your name, who you work for, and why you use JavaScript rather than TypeScript. We'll start with Tom. I am Todd. I work. For, I work for myself and my friends at a company called Catalyst Squad. We also work at a, our day job at a Matthews, and we are starting a startup called Katano. And we, what was the thing I was supposed to You don't have to go so deep because you're going to get to introduce yourself again anyway. I don't like TypeScript. I think it's stupid. I, I think it's excellent. awful. Excellent. All right. Is it my turn? Yeah, I'm sure. Lorna. Um, I'm Todd's wife. So I'm just here to watch and present. I don't work because he does. <laughs> we need. I'm Jacob. I work at Ripa Health, and we do use TypeScript, so I can't. I can't stand by. It's okay. You're under a, a, an agreement. We understand. I, yeah. There's there's contracts involved. <laughs> Regrets had. The Stasi. Uh, my name is Travis Barney. I work at Vivid. Um, I. Use JavaScript on legacy projects that haven't been migrated to TypeScript yet. Okay, we we'll won't go to you again. <laughs> Casey? I'm Casey. I work for me, and I haven't done much JavaScript or TypeScript, so I don't have, I have no paper. That just means they can mold you. Yeah. But there's no reason why you don't use TypeScript short. Uh, well, I'm Jordan. TypeScript sucks. Where do you work? For myself. Okay. Uh, I'm Caleb. Um, I work at a company called Tracker Translation. And we do not currently use JavaScript. Um, but we would probably use it later. <laughs> if you had a website, for example. But apparently you don't yet. That's okay. A lot of people don't have websites. Got apps. Oh, my name is Austin. Um, I work for Humanity. Um, I recently had to start learning TypeScript uh, when I discovered that uh, like half of all jobs that are relevant to me require it. So if anyone wants to stop for a job that won't make you use TypeScript, then I'll jump right on my phone. That's good. I like to hear that. We need more of those. Hi, I'm Manuel. I work for a company called Nine Energy and use TypeScript in the back end, and we're currently in the process of migrating our front end from JavaScript to TypeScript. And I hate it because it's a pain in the ass to migrate. That's right. That's what I like to hear. Um, I'm Kyle. I work at a company called Asian Health, and I use TypeScript. So I don't have strong opinions about it. That's too bad. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, AJ, and, and I... Uh, I work both for Savvy Legal and Dash Angular, and uh, I hate TypeScript because I'm a ra reasonable person <laughs> who doesn't hate myself. Yeah, exactly. All right. So with that all out of the way, uh, quick, quick shout out. Thanks very much to Travis for uh, taking care of us tonight, and thanks to Vivint for doing the hosting and the pizza and all that. And with all that out of the way, we'll go ahead and. Uh, Hand it right on over to Todd. Let's give him a, a hand to make him feel welcome here. <laughs> but don't make him feel too welcome because yeah. he does get a little that way. I appreciate playing pretend for a moment. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so we're here to talk about cryptography. I don't know how many of you know what cryptography is or are interested in it, but we're going to talk about it regardless. The goal here is not to uh, teach you everything you need to know to like be an expert at cryptography, but like to give you the concepts and knowledge of the primitives of the Lego bricks. So you can start talking about it, start diving into the areas that actually matter to you or don't matter to you. This is not a talk about <coughs> cryptocurrency, which is why cryptography is spelled out in the title, but it is uh, related in that the same primitives will apply. So if that's interesting to you, great. We're going to cover things that you're, that you're interested in. Um, I do want to walk to you, walk you through kind of the history of it, and I want you to walk away from this talk, ready to get into those specific implementations. Maybe dive into the math if you want. You know, whatever floats your boat. 
Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, I will say, I'm not really like important or anything. I, these slides are required and I hate tooting my own horn, but I do know what I'm talking about in this. Uh, I've been at computing for a very long time. I've been paid to do literally everything, like real American dollars to do literally everything except for compilers. <laughs> um, I have even worked on mainframes in COBOL for real American dollars. I'm not that old, I just worked for a company that had it and had they needed help. Um, <clears throat> you can find me as Todd Punk just about anywhere uh, if you want to, except for Instagram where that was taken by a terrible punk band that doesn't really do anything anymore. Uh, my biggest claim to fame in this particular space is that I have two MPA studio approved DRM schemes for pre-DVD release content for use in in-flight entertainment devices. Um, and I help design and augment the workflows for those devices and the cryptography involved in securing all of that content. So like we got, we got stuff like six months before it was released on DVD. Um, and then it was on like giant tapes and we had to, to secure it through like an air gapped environment, like mission impossible kind of stuff. It was weird. Uh, so I'm happy to talk more about that and the specific use cases or the details of that, like to prove it if you're really interested in that or whatever, but we'll do that after the presentation. Um, so let's talk about what cryptography is for. Um, because cryptography is older than computers. It's not a computer thing at all. Uh, earliest communications way back somewhere around 1500 BC is uh, the, the earliest dates I've seen. We wanted information to be protected while being communicated between specific parties. And we know that because we found those communications <laughs> and intercepted them in the vernacular of, of cryptography. And then we broke the cryptography on them. Um, turns out it wasn't very sophisticated back then. They didn't really plan for our supercomputers, not that we needed them. Uh, so for thousands of years it has been uh, this art of secret telling. I want to tell you secrets safely. So. In cryptography, we often refer to those parties and communication steps or the paths for the, the, the medium of those, those communications. Like all communications, the medium and the message exist. But let's talk about the players as well. Let's talk about Alice, Bob, and Eve. These are like stand-in examples that are common in like cryptography discussions and explanations of algorithms and things. So uh, they come up in examples a lot. They're relative stand-ins. You could add more, you could replace them with whatever names you're comfortable with, it doesn't matter. The point is it's Alice, Bob, and Eve for the purposes of this discussion, and you'll see why in a bit. So, usually there are three parties. Uh, now we can cover why someone would want to use this technology to solve this problem, and why technology can never solve the social or other problems of trust and validation, and where the, the line is drawn. Alice, in this wonderful example, wants to send Bob a message, okay? But she wants to ensure that Eve cannot read it. She doesn't like Eve, so she does this by using a secret that she shares with Bob directly. She says, don't share this with anyone else, right? And they encrypt the message so that they both know that they're communicating with each other and nobody else, without the key, can decrypt the message, right? So Eve clearly cannot use a key that she has not been given to read the message. Does everybody agree with that? Anybody have a problem with that so far? Okay, so like the communication is going that way, not to Eve. Eve bad. She's very gossipy. You don't want to give her information. Oh. I was going to say, that's probably where it came from, eavesdropping. Like she's trying to listen in, but it's, I think that it's from the Eve of the house. Yeah, it's, it's unrelated. It's very sad. <laughs> They missed an opportunity to make a pun, man. Uh, so, all right, so there's the core con concepts in place, right? Uh, we've been doing this long enough to know that even a nation state, like an entire country, like all of China, uh, they have lots more resources for computing than we do, pretty much any of us. Uh, and they have way more manpower that they can throw at a problem. But it would still take so long for them to brute force the encryption algorithms that we've invented uh, with current technology that we would all be dead and nobody would even probably have records of our names by the time they finished because it would be millennia from now. It would just be ridiculous. 
So uh, that can be measured in billions of years. Billions. I want you to remember this, this, this power, this strength that we've got in those primitives, right? So it sounds pretty ironclad. Tech has clearly solved this issue, and the trust is needed to, uh, or the trust has been built that was needed to keep Eve out, right? Unbeknownst to everyone but Eve and Bob, Eve and Bob are the same person. So this ruins everything, of course, and is the basis of the actual problem. We can only do so much. Uh, this was always the problem with DRM, and this is always the problem, despite having built ironclad DRM that studios, with their many, many resources to keep their content secure, approved. I understand at the end of the day, your eyeballs are not digital. Oh no. Your eyeballs are not digital, and as such, I have to reset this because I put a thing on my clicker. It's very sad. Um, at the end of the day, your eyes are not, not digital and they cannot be encrypted. So something has to convey that and you can always capture that. Uh, all of the security in the world doesn't stop a teenager with a cell phone in his pants from stealing your movie. It just doesn't matter, right? Um, now, there's lots of ways to go into that. That's not the point of this talk. The point is, like, there's a line there that technology cannot help with. And even if you were to get digital eyeballs, that's still not solving the problem because your brain's still going to interpret those signals. Like, there's, there's always a point where it's unencrypted, right? So these are only tools. We can only do so much. So it opens some questions about why Alice trusts Bob, but not Eve. It's a very human question. I'm not going to answer it. But it also asks, uh, why doesn't she know about Bob or Eve's double life? Uh, but what is clear here is trust isn't something that cryptography solves at all. Cryptography can give you information that you might trust, but it is not a trust-building system of its own. Cryptography also doesn't offer anything to assure us that we aren't being recorded, because we absolutely are, and that we can trust the data being sent, because a... a an encrypted and signed virus is still a virus, right? And it can't actually guarantee us that there's any human involved at all. Like, we use cryptography with servers. There's no human involved in that, that discussion. If it's portraying itself as a human, like in, say, chat GPT, you don't get any guarantees from the cryptography primitives that that's a human or even someone you think it is, an entity you think it is, right? So we're just providing primitives as tools, nothing more. We're not making promises. We don't want to dive into like more layers, add more things. We want to be very honest with ourselves. Okay, so there's, there's the line. So let's talk about the primitives. The first one is the easiest, it's ciphers. Ciphers are the oldest. They're also the most primitive. Um, I wouldn't say that they're not useful now, but they are like useless on their own. Because a cipher is just like a way of changing things around. They're like decoder rings from the serial boxes or the Enigma machine from World War II. Those are all ciphers, right? Well, when we use a cryptography API, it's going to say cipher, decipher. Yeah, yeah. And those are not primitive. They're, it's, a, it's a primitive concept, not... Okay. These are all conceptual, like in the tool chains that we'll use they will give you an abstraction that this is whatever they do. But like, again, it's not required by computers at all. A cipher is a thing that, well, I mean, here's the example, Rot13. Uh, there are 26 letters in the English alphabet, and if you rotate them 13 letters, you end up in the opposite of the, uh, of, of the alphabet. That can be a cipher, and it is. It's a really easy cipher. We were using it the other day when discussing chess to like, spoiler alerts, um, it works great. Because you have to go through effort to rotate it, but it's not a whole lot of effort. Plenty of websites do that. They have ROT uh, 1 through 25 as well. I don't know why they have ROT 1. They probably have ROT 26 as well. Just, the more numbers you, that, like if you do a ROT like 52, that's the same as a ROT 26 on your, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> but, um, it, it is still useful today, even though it's not cryptographically secure, and it is the, the purest example of a, a cipher. It's exactly like a decoder ring. Uh, many decoder rings actually did Route 13. 
it's a way that you can encrypt or decrypt in, in the highest altitude definition of encrypt and decrypt. Okay? All right. Any questions on ROT13 or Cypress? Awesome. Okay. Hashes. We're not going to dive in deep here, but they will come up plenty. So I'm bringing them up here and then not going to give you an example. Uh, I have a question. Yes. What does ROT stand for? Rotate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hashes are fairly well known. Everybody's heard of them at the very least. Uh, the way they work is you take some info, you run it through this hashing function, this algorithm. There are many. And at the end, you get a nice, wonderful little check for consistency, or you could hand the message to and a hash to a friend, and they could verify that like all of it was the same. It wasn't tampered with. It's kind of a signing thing, like if they do, if they hash it the same, they have the same algorithm, it should come out with the same hash, and that's how like you get all these MD5 sum files or whatever from downloads, especially for like open source projects. Here's the tarball and here's the MD5 so you can tell that nobody's messed with it. At least as far as this server is concerned, if like you were to reroute a DNS or something that it doesn't validate who it is, right? It only validates the contents haven't changed according to this hash. Again, it's not solving trust. I don't know where I was reading, but yeah, so hashes are not terribly useful on their own, but they are very useful for data integrity, and you will see how that plays into a lot of the different algorithms and whatnot that we're, we're gonna talk about very, very quickly here. Uh, so we'll come back to the humble hash. What's the difference between a hash and a checksum? The checksum was one of any algorithms for hashing? A hash and a checksum are basically built on the same principles. A hash is typically in, and again, there's no standards body, there's not like a government entity that's like approving the use of this word, but it's usually a cryptographically secure algorithm, meaning you're not gonna get a whole lot of uh, collisions, and the idea is that even the pigeonhole principle shouldn't apply in most scenarios. Right. Does everybody know what the pigeonhole principle is? No. Okay, pigeonhole principle is very important with hashes or B trees, all sorts of things. Anything where you are using a hash, in fact, or trying to put things in slots. If you have a pigeon box, it is filled with pigeonholes. They are spots for pigeons. And if you are trying to take all of the pigeons and shove them in the holes and you have too many pigeons, you are going to be doubling up how many pigeons you put in each hole. And if they can only fit a few, then you just you just spill over. Like sometimes, some hashing algorithms, like usually hash maps in programming, are very tolerant of collisions, and that's fine. In this particular case, uh, the principle is, I am reducing like an MD5 hash is 256 bits, right? Or, I don't know if it's an exact number, but, it's about 256, some order of two, it's fine, just bear with me. <laughs> the, that hash cannot represent every single piece of information in the universe because it only has that many bits. It's only that many combos. What's the max int for a 64-bit integer? You know, the more bits you add, the, the higher that number is, but it is not infinite. And so... The hashing algorithm has the problem of, I can take two files and they can hash to the same thing. Are they the same file? No, you can't guarantee that, right? So there, there's other information needed. There's other methodologies for that sort of thing. But that's the pigeonhole principle. And it applies in a lot more than cryptography. I, I, for the record, I think it's something closer to between 40 and 80 bits. It's definitely below 128. It's 128. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 128 is where you're safe. That's what a UUID is. Yes, yes. The UUID is just making the space big enough that it would be cosmically likely to have a collision without any other checks. That's, That's usually mean. what a hashing fun function is over a CRC32 or something. Gotcha. Checksums are often used for error correction on the wire. When the, the term checksum is being used specifically and intentionally. Mm -hmm. It's usually for error correction, whereas hash is usually for integrity that's cryptographically secure. Yeah. Well, it's usually properties like how long does it take to compute as well? 
Oh. Like a CRC can be done in band, like as you're going through any other algorithm of checking the data. So like network programming, very important. You get a cyclic redundancy check. CRC. Uh, cyclic redundancy check. <laughs> you get a cyclic redundancy check uh, when you are doing any sort of packet on a TCP IP network. And your, your card, your network interface card does that for you in band. And it's great because it doesn't have to like take any extra like algorithm, like big O notation, it's not taking any extra cycles to do that because it can just do it in band. It's reading the same data to buffer it into memory and it can just check right then and be fine. So it's great. Psycho redundancy is awesome, but it's not cryptographically secure or really robust. You will have collisions all day long, that sort of thing. So, so, so basically it gives you a percentage that's, so, uh, Pretty low. It, it, uh, you're, you're not. You're not. It's not a high degree of accuracy. Right? Yeah. Like you, you're saying, out of all the four kilobyte messages in the world, we need. You know, like it's. It, there's there's a lot of them that could be, but but if you take a checksum and it's only, I don't know, it's like what eight bits or something. There's like 256 possibilities. So there's a there's. There's some possibility of an error, let's say it's a one in a thousand, and then there's some possibility of a checksum um, being correct even when the data is wrong. Let's say it's one in 256, so you multiply the one in 256 by one in um, a thousand, so 256,000, then divide by two, and that is basically your failure rate, is that out of every 128,000 messages, there's going to be an undetected failure. And those numbers are probably wrong. I don't yeah, know. the numbers are not important. The gist of those heuristics are things you want to keep in mind because they don't matter to you right now, I hope. But if you're trying to develop something secure, these are the kinds of things that you're going to need to dive in and think about like that you just take for granted now, and that's totally fine, but now you know what kind of questions to ask someone who knows better or whatever else. So let's talk about actual key cryptography, symmetric specifically, because for actually encrypting data, not just hashing it, uh, you need a key and you need math. So the first scheme we're gonna talk about is taking a key and applying it to bytes. Anytime someone is talking about a pre-shared key in their algorithm, it's probably a symmetric key in crypt cryptography. So what that looks like is I take some data, maybe a hard drive, I don't know, whatever, bytes. I apply a key to it and I get an encrypted set of bytes. That sounds like I'm oversimplifying, but it's not. Because anything more complicated is actually getting into the math, which is not important for this conversation. The, the key is one way and then the key can be applied in the other way, but there's only one key. So you're doing an encrypt or a decrypt operation using the key on bytes. Now note that if you apply the decrypt operation on the same bytes that were not encrypted in the first place, you can do that and you will get unencrypted bytes and it will be weird. Depending on the math, that might be a reverse encryption. So you're just applying the decrypt and then you would need to apply the encrypt but not all schemes follow that rule. The point is that with a key, there will be an encrypt and a decrypt operation and they might follow the reverse, they might not, it doesn't matter, it's okay. Breathe, we'll get through this together. There's only one key. So, important things. Most content is gonna be this way. This is the scheme used for the vast majority of cryptography. Even when you're not doing this, you're doing this. And we'll get into why in a bit. There's also like that key is going to live with the content or for the duration of its existence on the wire and nothing more. Your key, <laughs> we'll get there, is gonna be different. So we'll get, we'll, we're gonna come up that in a moment. We want to talk about why, and that is you have instruction sets on pretty much every CPU we've made in the last 15 years that include 
cryptography exchange, well, acceleration instructions. So a lot of it's uh, AES-based. Um, I don't remember what AES stands for. Do you? American Encryption Standard. I think you're wrong, but... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it's close to that. The it's point is, like, you will, you will have a lot more hardware acceleration in that space than you ever ha will in a non-symmetric key scenario. Uh, because there's not much going on there, and we'll get to that. So, less CPU cycles, less wall clock time. Those are both great, especially when trying to play massive amounts of content. Or say, read a hard drive. You want that to be fast. You don't want to take half your CPU cycles on encrypting your hard drive. Same, same principles apply here. So, asymmetric key is like the opposite of that, except it's the same. We have public and private keys, and we are using those terms loosely. Because in some math, it matters. The public key can only be used for whatever, and the private key can only be used for whatever. But it's much, much stronger cryptography and requires much more CPU power, much larger keys, that sort of thing. So there's a lot more bytes in those keys. Well, bits is really what we talk about. Like the, the number of bits is more important. Bits of entropy, etc. And it's more expensive on CPU and wall clock time. But we get a lot of abilities out of it. Like... We can take something and we can publish the private uh, public, or we can use the public key to encrypt it, and then only the private key can decrypt it, unless the math doesn't support that operation. In which case, you've got to use the private key and then decrypt with the public. Again, the maths are important, but only when you're considering what you want to do with it. If you want to have like a perfect exchangeable public-private, you are making different trade-offs, and we won't get into that because those are specific to algorithms, and that's not important. The primitive is there's a public and a private key. You only use one for one operation and the other for another operation. And whether it's public or it's private is actually only going to matter to your specific use case. There are two keys. Remember which one's which. Label them associate, uh, appropriately and you'll be fine. Well, I do want to add one thing to that, which is in all of the algorithms that I am aware of, for example, all of the uh, algorithms of the Go standard library, mm -hmm. a private key can always generate a public key. Um... Yes. I mean, pretty much that's the standard for every that I'm aware of, because even historically. The public key is, there's a function that you run on the private key mm -hmm. that will generate the public key. Yes. So typically the private key is an X and the public key is a Y, and then some math works out such that the Y can do some stuff that can be decoded by the X. Yeah, so and the math is fascinating. Important. What? Is it one-to-one, -one, like the, you run that on the private key and it will always give you the same public key? Yes. 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 So if you ever lose the public key, it's like, eh, okay. you just generate it on the fly. Um, and we used to do that in some of our web servers because that was easier because you could just load that into a, a Flash ROM or Twitter. I have stories. Uh, so some of you may be wondering, this is so expensive. I mean, it is so expensive. It is orders of magnitude more expensive CPU style to use public-private key cryptography. But it's also, you may be aware, the standard for SSL or TLS, as we call it now. So why are we having so many devices, including underpowered cell phones, doing this super expensive thing? Hold that thought. Let's talk about signatures. Signatures are like hashes, but now we're involving another step. A signature Again, this is the conceptual. The actual details might change some things out, and that's fine, because signature is probably the loosest of the concepts that we're discussing today. The notion of a signature is, in real life, I sign a thing, right? Like, I just sign my name. And that means that I really did say that, or that I meant this contract, or that I'm entering into this agreement, or whatever. And if you want to go extra, you can have a notary stamp it and sign it too, with more signatures. More signatures make it more secure. In real life, that sort of works because we're all physically present and we take that for granted. In not real life, the digital signature is based on those keys where I say, uh, I'm gonna sign it with this key. You're not present, you can't watch the bits fly across the wire, nobody can. So you just have to trust that this key represents me, right? 
And that's why, again, cryptography does not solve trust. And this is why certificate authorities exist. But again, that's a, a deeper conversation we will get to in a moment. So, a signature is we take a hash, uh, like a cyclical redundancy check or a real hash, preferably a real hash, and we say, all right, I took this hash, I did it, and I used my private key to encrypt it so that anybody who has my public key can validate that I did it with my private key. They don't need my private key to validate that. They just need to know what its fingerprint is, and they, they can have that, whatever. And then they can do it with, they can unencrypt it and get the same hash. It's like the integrity and authenticity of whatever I'm sending. This is really important in a lot of, a lot of especially web dev stuff, but even just normal computer stuff, like your trusted computing stuff, uh, signing binaries for delivery on like packages, things like that. You need to send both the hash and the signature so that it can be verified. Otherwise, you're just saying like, I, trust me, this is a hash. It's, it's fine. And that does happen, don't get me wrong. That's a perfectly valid communication. But you are dropping one thing and assuming that the trade-offs are good for your use case. Again, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to tell you what questions to ask so you know what you're getting yourself into. So, uh, anyone can verify that, that's great. They can validate that the message hasn't been tampered with, also great, and you haven't exposed your private key, so nobody else can do it for you. Unless they have access to your private key, you are you. Isn't that awesome? It's kind of like if I copied your uh, signature. We'll get there. Okay, so let's talk about secure communications and walk through an example. This is not an example that is used in real life, but it is really close to several, and depending on what your exposure is, will determine which one you think it's more like. But it's, it's not like any of them, just trust me. Just, uh, the thing I want you to take away from this is that you should follow those standards. Save yourself the time. Uh, do the thing that is generally accepted to work. Don't try to reinvent that wheel. Especially like, don't try to do better than SSL. You're not going to. You don't beat the entire industry. I don't think you would even beat one of their mathematicians. So uh, that's why people say not to roll your own crypto, but the whole point of this talk is somebody had to roll crypto first, and I would like to know how to avoid the pitfalls of doing something that might get my company in trouble or my data in trouble or whatever, and validate that what they're doing is insane or not, or validate that I don't need all of that heavy lifting. It's kind of like off, like I have a username and password. I salted it, I hashed it, PBKF2, it's fine. I don't need to like buy an auth service if I know that and you're, I'm using those standards. But I have to know what those standards are to be able to make that evaluation. That's what this is all about. Well, so, and, and I, there's, I think there's some confusion that comes in when people say don't roll your own. People start to think that it means don't implement your own because there's a yes. big difference between inventing a new hashing algorithm yes. and saying, "Here's an example in uh, Go. How do I convert it to Rust?" Very much so. And where those lines are drawn are not always agreed upon, and I'm not going to weigh in on. But I'm, I want to arm everyone to have their own arguments. So, here's an example flow. Two entities establishing a secure communication channel. When one on which they can have an entire conversation and never have to leave the secureness of it. Pretty early on, we can see a, a hurdle. I, I know it's not there yet. Okay, all right. Just sure. But we'll discuss that in a minute. Okay, so first things first. I would like to open a secure channel. Sure, I can do these three protocols. Pick one. Well, I can do two of those. Let's use the more secure of the two. Okay. All right, here's my public key. I literally can't read this on my tiny preview screen, so I have to look up here like a moron, and I'm sorry. Here's mine. Here's some random bits for the first half of the shared key that we will use. These are my random bits. Encrypted with your public key and my private key in that order, Here's a hash of those bits, and here's my signature using that hash with my private key. 
Excellent. I verified that. Here's the second half of the shared key encrypted with your public key and my private key in that order. Here's a hash of those bits. Here's my signature using the hash with my private key. Awesome. I'm ready to switch to purely the shared key. Here's my test message encrypted with the shared key. Here's your test message back and my test message. Here's your test message back. Excellent. What can I do for you today? That is a lot like a lot of different communications. And if you're in the web, that might sound like TLS, or at least the vagueness of TLS. If you're in networking, that might sound like TCP, or at least the vagueness of TCP. Uh, it's probably closer to IPsec, but still, it's all like we, we have kind of the same patterns in different layers. That's important, and I won't tell you why, because as you explore, I just want you to remember that these things happen everywhere. Okay? So, if you're going for security, if, you're, if your whole purpose of this whole endeavor is to get secure, chances are you want to follow the standards for the rest of your ecosystem. So obviously if you're implementing a web server, you don't invent your own TLS because the rest of the things that you need to work with are not going to do that. If you uh, are writing a browser, same thing. If you're commit signing for Git, if you don't know what that is, it's signatures for your Git commits. And uh, you want to follow those standards because other Git tools and your Git host or whatever are going to require those kinds of things. You can't just invent your own wheel here and go off the rails, you know? For things you're doing on your own though, you should start with something standard if you can. I mean, path of least resistance, don't get me wrong. But don't be afraid to reach for something more basic or uh, more uh, interesting if it suits your needs, if it actually suits your needs and not like, I think it'll be fine. Uh, if security isn't what you're going for, this opens up a lot more doors. Uh, if you just need to encrypt a file, you don't need like a super fancy algorithm for that. You can just use any key. You can use relatively cryptographically insecure stuff if you're not trying to like keep it from you know, a nation state or something. If you're just keep, keeping it secret from your, your kids or something, I don't know what that would be, but <laughs> the analogy is going to go to dark places now. But the, the, the point is like you can hide it from like uh, yourself or scripts or whatever to get that kind of privacy. And that sounds like it's, oh man, why are you hiding things? This is how disk encryption works. It has a single key. It just does AES or something and it encrypts your whole thing from thieves, random person walking in your room, whatever. The, the basics are there and they have really low barriers to entry. And I think we've, we've built a lot of fear around them. Uh, everything else beyond these, uh, these, these require you to think about trade-offs. So when you are, if you're gonna roll your own anything, you wanna be well-versed in the kinds of attacks that can happen at different points in the chain that you're building. Even if that's a chain that you're following someone else's standards, even if you're using some other library, you want to know what is this doing? You want to know I'm building a TLS infrastructure. I'm not implementing a new browser or a web server or anything. I'm just trying to make sure that I rotate my keys at the right time. Great, you still need to know when is that safe to do? If I kill all the trans or all the connections to this web proxy that is where TLS is terminated, what happens to the communications? Do the clients retry? Do they not? Are they able to like renegotiate using the same key or a different key? These are questions that you probably have never asked yourself unless you're like more of a opsy kind of person. I don't know. I'm not I'm not here to judge. But those are important as a developer because if you're trying to build on those assumptions and you made assumptions that were wrong, suddenly all of your PII is leaked. It's very weird. The, the weakest link in your cryptography chain is the, the point it will be broken. It doesn't matter how many bits or how sizable of a key or how great your encryption algorithm is if your key exchange algorithm is weak because that's what a man in the middle is. They get in when the keys are getting exchanged because that same conversation we had, you have no idea who you're talking to. 
you only know that there was a key used and you think you have it. But a certificate authority signs, yes, I trust that this is the key. But if that certificate authority is your company and they're signing their own keys for every address you visit via a proxy, that is going to look to your browser to be the same. That's fine. Man in the middle attacks are not always attacks. Sometimes they are proxies. Trust is not solved by cryptography. <laughs> So uh, there's a lot of really good things that you can do with that man in the middle attack. If you are building that trust into the certificate authority that your company gives you, they can scan all of your traffic for malicious injections. They can make sure that you're not uh, leaking information to wherever because somebody installed a script on your system that is going to download a ransomware key and then upload the, the, the private or the, the public uh, replacement key somewhere, it can stop that, that sort of thing. This is very common in security. The same tools that malicious people are using are the same people, or all the same tools that non-malicious people are using for very similar use cases. This is why it's a hard problem. How do you know that you're sending a message to Bob and not Eve? They're the same person. So, if you're not going for high security issues, just do some basic validation of your, your methodology and things will work out. Uh, many JWT, JWT implementations do the same signing algorithm that is basically a hash and an encryption of that hash with an asymmetric key pair. You don't need a fancy library to do that. The primitives in like pretty much any cryptography library are going to allow you to do that. Um, so, Yes, so that's all I wanted to cover as far as that uh, build, roll your own implementation or whatever else based on what you need and don't be afraid to try and learn because you know we're gonna need to improve these over time and somebody's gonna need to learn and somebody's gonna need to make the mistakes that we learn from. Questions? We've just covered a lot. You can stew as much as you want. It's totally fine. Out, they don't know what question to ask yet. <laughs> How many pigeons were harmed in the making of this talk? Uh, only three. <laughs> but they were old. So you say that we need to improve it. Like what's, what needs improving right now? Well, so it's an arms race always and always has been. You know, since the beginning of time. Um, there, it's a put, it's it's an, a, just an endless puzzle, and so there are people that want to break the puzzle, and those same people aren't always like malicious, like some people just really just want to break those algorithms. It's just fun, and so you find research groups that are breaking hashing algorithms and finding collisions. Uh, there was one uh, about eight nine years ago. Uh, I wrote a program that did uh, some MD5 some hashes, and at about the same time, I read a paper that was, here's an algorithm that you can use to generate a file that will match this MD5 sum. And then you can get another file, a completely different file, and pad it the same, and get this checksum again. Two completely different files, starting from, outcome is same file size, same hash. That ruins a lot of what I was doing. So uh, as I was diving into those, I had to learn a lot more about like, okay, so why is this insecure? Why is this considered insecure now? And there's also things like rainbow tables. Rainbow tables are great. Uh, but th those same things are not necessarily maliciously used. They can be, but they're just tools. And they are also used to do the same improvements of, okay, well, this isn't good enough. How can we secure it more? They begin the conversation, they ask the questions, and they say, okay, well, uh, quantum computing is coming out, and we have some algorithms that the mathematicians have come up with that might work to break this if we ever build the thing. How do we resist that? And some other mathematicians will be like, Elliptic curves, absolutely. 
and it's much more resistant to quantum algorithms that we've never been able to run yet against basically breaking your encryption. So if, if the guarantees on your cryptography are, it'll take 120 years to break this. But tomorrow it's like, well, we found a way to do it in an hour. That's where like the improvement's always coming, always. And if you don't explore it, you don't know if you're interested enough to even like go into that and be like, I'm gonna be a red team guy now. Whatever, whatever your interest might be, so. Would super, would these, uh, let's say we got super connector, right? Uh huh. Um, if that were the case, would that merely heat up the arms race, just use like a thousand times bigger, uh, like bits? Or no, it's it's not just about compute thing? power. Um, so, uh. This is a, leaning a little bit on crypto, uh, cryptocurrency, but like there's different uh, algorithms for hashing alone that will require different kinds of computing power in order to use. One needs a lot of memory, one needs a lot of CPU, one needs whatever, the, the fastest CPU cycles, needs massive parallelization. Like these, these are all very different aspects of computing. And it's all just number crunching, like at the end of the day, it's just, a bunch of math from PhDs who geek out about this stuff. And it's great, but those characteristics are being played out. And as we get more characteristics, there's just going to be more just angles that we just add more things on. And so it's not always just like, oh, they'll be able to build a faster computer. It's like, yeah, but they still need like seven exabytes of RAM that can all be accessed randomly. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, there's there's no fear of quantum computers. Uh, after all the billions of dollars that have been spent and all of the Newsweek articles that have had the cover of IBM or Google on it, <laughs> zero of them have been able to do anything other than find the prime factors of, I think the number, the highest number they've got to is 21. Th they can do it faster than a conventional computer can. And it doesn't take a conventional computer very long to factor 21. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird space. So this would not even particularly heat up the arms race. It would be like one little, well, maybe not a little change, but okay, a little pivot. Well, it, it depends. Like, my, my family photos, I want those encrypted in S3. I don't need to resist China attempting to get those. If they really want those, A, they will get them, and B, they could just ask. You know? <laughs> like, look, if you send me a USB stick and a few thousand dollars, you can have my family photos. You can just have them. But... Because the if, USB stick had a decryption. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But if you're like the NSA and you're trying to secure like the most top secret information that we have, you want to be perpetuating that arms race because anything that happens tomorrow to break anything in the chain is a risk to everything. So you want to be ahead of that game because there are other people that are playing the game. They're just there. You know? Do you want to lose to them? I am okay losing to them. I am. The NSA is not, and I'm not okay with the NSA losing to them. But the you might have different political leanings or whatever, I don't know. But the good news is that, you know, in six million years, when quantum computers have finally arrived, you'll be able to retrieve all of the backups that the NSA has been keeping for you in Bluffdale. All yep. of those phone conversations that you wish you could remember. You'll get them all. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll just be SQLable yeah. to a fee. One of the main things that we've noticed is that the most powerful air traffic attack is to just offer a guy some money. Yeah. Oh, oh, bring up the XKCD. Yeah. Oh. The requisite XKCD. Uh, and that can work for defense, too. They'll bring a bounty for somebody to hack you. But they won't tell anyone that they hack you. Oh my goodness, the world of the week is telling photos. 
<laughs> so Google gives away literally millions of dollars. Every, I mean, there, there are companies that they exist, that as a company they exist with top minds to hack things. And they all participate, and then you know whoever gets the bounty, they split it among the people. There we go, yes, this is the requisite XKC control. If you can't, uh, ah! Yeah. His laptop's encrypted. Let's build a million dollar cluster to crack it. No good. It's 4096 bit RSA. Blast! Our evil plan is foiled! What would actually happen? His laptop's encrypted. Drug him and hit him with his five dollar wrench until he tells us the password. Got it! <laughs> this is why I use a password manager, because in that instance, I could not help them. <laughs> I would be like, you know what? I really wish I could tell you. I really do, because this is going to hurt. <laughs> this will hurt you more than it will hurt me. Well, maybe not. <laughs> and, uh, another note, we do have quantum, uh, quantum resistant crypto cryptography today. Uh, it's not in any standard library that I'm aware of, but the algorithms have been worked out. It's basically uh, based on path walking, if you've ever heard of the problem of the drunken bishop, it's kind of like that. So you basically walk a path, I think it's in like seven dimensions, you walk a path in a direction, you roll the dice, you walk the path again, you roll the dice, you walk the path again, you roll the dice, you walk the path again. The encryption key is your dice rolls, and the public key is your uh, origin and your destination. And that Veritasium has a video on why that is, like, Veritasium has a video on the quantum stuff. But he's wrong about his conclusion that quantum computers will be available in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. For that, you can turn to, there's uh, Sabine, is her name, uh, I think it's Sabine. Offsetter or whatever? Yeah, yeah, and, and she explains quite simply why there is no risk of there being a quantum computer. And our own Levi Pearson, uh, I cannot find the message that he wrote, but uh, a few months ago someone asked about quantum computers on the mailing list, and he explained in fairly technical terms, but rockable, uh, as to how basically the quantum computers that exist are no more similar to quantum computers that we imagine about than an abacus is similar to uh, a Ryzen X5. Like, they, they don't even, they can't even do the calculations that would be useful. Mm -hmm. I got most of that, but I'm interested in the drunken bishop. Or it's not really a chess, a chess bishop making random moves across a higher dimensional board. Is that the, the I, I don't remember what it is about, but yeah. it's, it's uh, specifically that is an algorithm that is used for generating an SSH key art. You take the hash of the SSH key and you treat each of it as a dice roll and then the bishop rolls in two dimensions. But the quantum resistant algorithms are, are multi dimensional. Uh, the elliptic curve stuff is also relatedly quantum resistant. I think it's the same stuff. I could be wrong. I don't. I, it's I been a while be since I dived into the I don't, I don't the think so. I think there's something about FFTs. You can take like the frequency of prime numbers and it kind of resembles an FFT. And so, so the reason RSA. So get into some details. The reason RSA is so big, like 4096 bits, that sounds really big. It's not yeah. because uh, prime numbers only happen every so often and the period is not well established. So uh, you can't say that every 100 numbers is a prime number because then it would be divisible by 100. Uh, but Prime numbers do have a pattern to them. It's just not a pattern that we know how to describe or believe that can be described. Uh, and so within, and we actually, the keys that you use, they, they are likely prime numbers. It runs a couple of uh, math algorithms, because in order to know that it's a prime number, it would have to literally know every prime number below that number. And if you knew every prime number below that number, then that means that none of those keys would be valid. So if we could guarantee that a 4096-bit number were a prime number, then we would have completely invalidated all 
2048 bit keys, which, which we have not. But the, the idea is that the, the key space is very large, but the number of keys in the key space is very few. So a, I, I don't remember what the ratio is, but I think that uh, 2048 is equivalent to 128 bit of pure entropy and uh, 4096 is equivalent to 256 bits of pure entropy. So the, a 4096-bit RSA key is as strong as a 256-bit AES key, but even that's a little... Bruce Schneier is another name to know if you get into the implementation details, because. 128-bit key is essentially just as strong or stronger than a 256-bit key because of padding issues with the <laughs> algorithm because basically the mathematical computation only works on 128 bits and I thought, well, if we just do it twice, side by side, then that'll be 256 bits, but it turns out that that leaks information and so the 256 bits aren't actually 256 bits after all. And then Google, uh, you know, people will tell you don't use math.random which used to be good advice and now is pretty much bogus unless you're on a microcontroller. Uh, Google had an issue with Chrome where they did that same thing. Instead of having a 64-bit number, they just used two 32-bit numbers and it weakened the entropy significantly because on a pseudo-random generator within the key space of 32-bit number, you actually get to a point where the keys start to rotate and then you can guess them and there was this gambling company that, that basically went bankrupt because somebody who understood pseudo-random number generators was able to figure out uh, from their numbers that they basically they were able to rotate until they found the 32-bit number that matched. It's not hard because 32-bit numbers are not like super, super huge like a 64-bit number is. But since it was just 32-bit numbers, then they knew that the first number was the seed and then the next number would be the next number in sequence. And so then just by cracking one 32-bit number, they were able to crack the gambling site and be able to, you know, win every time against any other player. So. so, like, rotating through this easier lower dimensional space, is that kind of like what a rainbow table is? Rainbow no, rainbow table is just like, here's a bunch of things, usually dictionary words, that we know hash into these hashes. So if, like, say, this, this is the common use case back in the day, Say I have a password, and I am going to not want you to have that in plain text in the database, obviously, hopefully. <laughs> if you do this, repent quickly, but uh, no plain text passwords in the database, so they hash it. Great. So what they do is they take the password every time you log in, and they just hash it again and check. Does the hash max match? Great, I don't need to keep that anywhere. Like, nothing should ever check that except this, and now I can throw it away. But now, if I can establish something else that hashes into that pigeonhole principle, now I have a password that may not be your password, but it is also your password. You have to have a list of like every possible hash, and if that space is big enough, that should be possible. Uh... Rainbow tables will uh, do most common words. Uh, rainbow tables often will do, they are trying to do as many hashes as they can for common things so that you can look it up on a rainbow table so, in a massive database, usually in an irreputable site, and say, I would like something that gives me this hash. So spe specifically, rainbow tables are for Windows 2000, Windows XP, up until Windows 10, I think? And most OS schemes of the 90s, and yeah. Like rainbow tables, when people talk about rainbow tables, they're specifically referring to Windows because the encryption scheme in, or the hashing scheme in Windows was very weak. It, it was. Had a few bits. And Windows only allowed you to have a password up to you know, 12 characters or something. And so literally, there were rainbow tables for the different versions of Windows NT up till Windows. Because 12 characters is, is easy to calculate it. Right, so they well. literally pre-calculated terabytes of hashes. And so, and then this has also been done with, uh, if you check out Have I Been Pwned, 
uh, a lot of the passwords that have been leaked from like Adobe and stuff like that fall under the same principle where they're able to reverse the passwords by simply generating all possible characters. And this is why when people talk about salting your password, the salt is what prevents someone from being able to do a rainbow table because not only do they have to know the what the text of the password is, they also have to know what the salt is. So they would have to they would have to extract the database and then generate those eight terabytes of hashes for Just each you. individual password. So for old sites that are using MD5, this turns out to be perfectly feasible because of cryptocurrency, because we have developed ASICs that uh, application-specific integrated circuits, chips that do weak cryptographic functions uh, or that have become weak because of Bitcoin because they're optimized for Bitcoin and MD5 is one of those and SHA-1 is one of those. And so a lot of the things that were strong before Bitcoin are no longer strong because people have developed chips that can do tera hashes per second, mm. meaning that they can go, you could produce an entire rainbow table in a matter of seconds. So you, so you can avoid this by forcing people with long passwords or just salting. You can avoid it just by salt. But the if you're going to do a database with usernames and passwords, what you want to do is pbkdf2. It's publicly no privacy based. Kd is for key derivation. Key derivation function, yeah. Anyway, it's public key, blah, blah, blah. There's libraries for it in every language, many of them in the standard library, like I think. Web crypto. Yeah, I think pretty much every browser has it. And, and web crypto means that Node, Bun, and Dino have it. What you do is it will generate a string that is the whole thing that you need to store in the password field of your database. But it will be, here is the Alg the hashing algorithm that I'm using, here is the <coughs> salt that I'm using, or at least a representation that will work with this function forever. Here is the number of rounds that I'm going to do this. So I'm not going to just take this, combine them, and hash it once. You want it to be like 800,000 times. Well, that would, no, that's too high. You want it to be like 800,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> and that will only go up. You will need to go back and be like, like when I started doing this, it was like eight thousand, and now we literally do eight hundred thousand times. And because you want it to be expensive as hell, that still takes like four fifths of a second, eight hundred milliseconds ish, for us to calculate any time someone logs in. But that also means that even if someone were to leak the database, and using an incredibly powerful system to do this on. They would have to waste so much time because, yeah, you could do a terra hash, but that's like five checks. Good luck, you know? So it just, it, it takes and says, I would like you to waste so many more CPU cycles on this, and I will waste sometimes, like anytime someone logs in, to this. And I can accelerate that as well. Like I can use the normal hardware acceleration functions for other kinds of crypto on that, as long as it's a similar thing. Caveats, 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 right? But that's that's the whole goal is to I can put this in plain text and if the if the database is leaked, we're fine. We're fine. That said, the salt will be there. But it means that they can hack your password, not all of our passwords, you know. So don't make enemies. <laughs> okay, yeah. I I apologize for my instance. Eight hundred thousand, yeah. Uh it's, it's, it doesn't. It is not a specific number. Not of this if advice. it's going to be done on an Android phone. I mean, if you're doing it on an Android phone, how secure do you really need to be? <laughs> I mean, iPhone the same thing. Like, what is on this tiny device that's so underpowered that you need to secure it that highly? You know. Well, if you're using your phone as a Bitcoin miner, you have failed in many things. <laughs> Unless it's not, I mean, this isn't in one chip after all. Like. 
<laughs> Sorry. You just set me up so hard. It was, I, had to, I had to take the opportunity. Oh. I love you, AJ. Oh, I, I see don't what you're trying you. to do. I, see, I don't think you're oh, trying to do that. Oh, no, I already did. But I, I get what you're trying to do. <laughs> I am jealous of the M1. How's that? No, I, you don't have to be jealous of the M1. I'm just saying that, that the iPhone became the fastest desktop computer before they announced the M1 and then let people experience it on the desktop because it's the same CPU. Yeah, it is. I agree. Like, the, one of the things that was weird is that uh, there was some benchmark test that somebody had in a web browser and somebody had the idea to run it on an iPhone. It was a desktop bench, benchmark test and it was, you know, I don't know which iteration of the iPhone it was, but the iPhone was surpassing MacBook, Intels, and other similar class desktop systems that mm -hmm. were, you know, thousand dollar computers, two thousand dollar computers. Um, yeah. And that was that was the moment where I was like, ah, so. The so they turned the A4 into the M1. Or the A15 or whatever. Whatever it was, A57. A8, A11. 57 secret ingredients so to catch up. I mean, what? So are we all taking guesses? Yes. yes. Alright. Yes. So, anyway, are there, are there, oh, you had more questions? Oh, more I questions? Say, like, my phone's being like the only one gigahertz. They make calls to people. Well, this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could talk about that. <laughs> I don't call people on my phone. Why would I do that? <laughs> That's what a landline is for. That's what I have my laptop for. What would we do on our phones that justifies this? Nothing. How are you going to get that cool AI effect on your background during your call? <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes. So you said to use PB... PBK DF2. So there's, I know there's that, and there's like Beatrice and Argon 2. Mm -hmm. So why, why that? Um, it's just really standard and available and easy to use, um, specifically for salted pas passwords. Uh, bcrypt is not like a solution. Bcrypt is a smaller piece. You could use bcrypt in pbktf2. Um, that's just describing the hashing function. And again, that can be used in pbktf2. Uh, I think the last one I set up was SHA-256, but they allow all sorts of... This is a, also a thing if you've ever used any of the command line tools for things like HT password for basic auth on Apache or whatever else. That's, I, I think Nginx supports it as well and like all the things. Anyway, you want to give it uh, the algorithm that you want. By default, it will like use Scrypt or something, I don't remember what. But uh, you can give it other algorithms and it'll just put that right in the file and you can mix and match because it's, it's right in the file. This user's ID with blah, blah, blah. It's great. It's great. Highly recommend it. Uh, but you can probably use Bcrypt if you wanted, if 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 the library supports it. I know in Python I they had like seven. Blake. Hmm. Because Bcrypt and Scrypt all are alternatives to PBKDF2. I. They're always references and verses, which is better. I thought they were just I don't hashing they're functions. Not, no, they're not hashing functions. They're derivation functions. Oh yeah. Okay. Blake, I believe Blake is a hashing function. I don't yeah. know if there's an implementation for it that goes with PBK. But essentially, you should be able to use any hashing function with PBKDF2 because it is the select algorithm do rounds. Yeah, do many, 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 many rounds. Yes. Right. The, the, and the difference between them is whether they're CPU optimized. So whether they're optimized to, how they're optimized to not be accelerated. So PBKDF2 is old. It is not very optimized to not be accelerated on common computers. Meaning that if you run a SHA-2 800,000 times, that's because it's accelerated on the CPU. Blake is not popular enough, or, and, and Bcrypt and Scrypt are not popular enough to have been implemented on most CPUs. And Scrypt, either Bcrypt or Scrypt, is actually optimized to waste RAM. So it's not how many CPU cycles you need in order to uh, achieve the hash. It's how much RAM you need in order to achieve the hash. Uh, so how much swapping out you have to do and stuff. Right. And 
and so there's different trade-offs there, but it's my sense, I would love to hear what you say, but my <coughs> sense is PDFK, PDKDF2 is the right thing to use 99% of the time because it's implemented everywhere and you're not likely to screw it up and you can use it from the standard library and not have to deal with, oh crap, we have to update to node 20 because the latest version is the only version that has this feature that's breaking what Vercel's next JS compiler and uh, but the bcrypt C++ module has not been updated for node 20 and so now we are stuck on node 16 and, and just did you have a bad experience was that we had a bad experience but it sounded we very specific <laughs> well I mean I've had experiences like that in the past it's, yeah. it's not it's not the first one but we, we had one in the latest we had one a couple weeks ago where it's been all these frameworks were using bleeding edge features that you can't get in anything except for literally the node release that came out yesterday and then you have to like mutually exclusively either support node 20 or be able to support like back to node 12. Yeah. Yeah. Story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> Aside from that upsetness, uh, it really just depends on what you're doing as well. Like, this is why like there, there, there's no universal advice. Uh, if you're doing password with salting for an authentication system, it's just going to be there and the most flexible, and so it, it will be right 99% of the time. But at the same time, like there's other things that are better for different use cases. I can run PBK DF2 in a variety of ways on a PIC32 with 4K of, like it just takes nothing to, to run this stuff. Um, and this is actually really important for a lot of other use cases, like the, the DRM scheme that I had approved was, uh, it was basically AES, but the, the key that was used to encrypt all the other keys on the hard drive was stored in a second flash microcontroller that was running its own code and it was unique to the physical device. And it would have things that you could ask it to do over an I2C channel, which is like a single wire bus <laughs> that you get to signal with a microcontroller on to exchange that key so that you could unencrypt your own hard drive and it was just like, a, it was insane. So if you swapped hard drives and devices, they just wouldn't work anymore and nobody had the keys unless you were to strip the, the actual chips and read it from that. And it was just, it was crazy, crazy stuff. It was, those kinds of constraints may change the answer for you. <laughs> so, yeah, just depends. And on that, on that note, the DRM that's in your browser uses a version of RSA where all of the constants have been fiddled with, not to make them more secure, but just to make it much, much harder to retrieve the key. Because if you get the key in memory and you know it's RSA, well then, you know how to apply the encryption. But since they change all the constants and they have like self-mutating code and crap, even if you know, even if you have the private key, they've made a private algorithm. <laughs> yeah, white bind. White bind three. White, well, white bind two was that way as well, but then that was cracked and then they had to do white bind three and they took it to the Give it level. time. The pirates are always smarter, <laughs> always. Pirates are coming from inside the house. All right, well, so we clap. I'm clapping for AJ. That's 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 what I'm clapping for. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. We I'm did clapping it for you. I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can stop recording and be spicy if we want. We can stop recording and be spicy. But before we do that, I want to know. I want to know if anybody wants to know anything about Node in regards to this stuff, because I'd be happy to bring up on the screen a quick example showing 
here's a specific API in web crypto that does the thing that he was talking about. How long? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? That's the JavaScript we know? Uh, okay. I mean, it's in the thing. So I thought this was just, it was not your grandma's JavaScript. What, what, what was it? What did you do with it in Patriot? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There, there is some of these primitives yeah, yeah. available in the browser as well. Like the browser APIs, there, there's some cryptography APIs available. Obviously, the node side is moving very differently. Well, I, that's no. The web crypto is uh, node. Okay, as this is actually the thing. Why <coughs> node twenty? As of node twenty, they have finally dropped all pretenses of the crypto object being separate in node. So they've been doing this since node 16, but node 18, they, but with node 20, the crypto object is now global and it is web crypto. Mm. Uh, but that's the same with Bun and Dino. Mm. So whether, no matter which one, you're, you're always using web crypto. The caveat is, if you want to do the not idiotic thing and be able to take a stream and have it be encrypted or decrypted or hashed or whatever, like you would want with anything that's over four kilobytes, mm -hmm. then you do need to revert back to node crypto because until winter CG standardizes crypto streams, we don't yet have a streamable interface despite the fact that the browser already has a streamable interface <laughs> and despite the fact that web crypto was developed to work with the browser primitives. Wait, so no, it's not, it does crypto differently than the browser? Yes, so web crypto is a standard. Yeah. And the web crypto standard is usable in all environments. Right. Uh, the web crypto standard has a lot of flaws to it. It is much more cumbersome. So if you were to use any programming language, pick Go, pick Rust, pick Zig, Pick no, node, well, not the language, but the platform node. Uh, you know, pick pick any any standard library, any any language that has standard library crypto in existence, and it'll be a fairly straightforward. Like, here's how you do X and Y. In the browser, everything requires literally four to five extra steps. And I, I, on JavaScript Jabber, we actually interviewed one of the people that was on the standards body who fought against this nonsense. But they did it for security by obscurity because the idea is hackers aren't motivated enough to use a lot of try catches to figure out which operations are supported and which aren't. But regular developers that would want to use a standard library are, are sophisticated enough to break everything down into small pieces and do all the testing to get things right. So, so that's... One motivated hacker makes a library and then all those hackers do <laughs> that and it's no longer the case? Yeah. So are they not familiar with script kitties? Because this was a thing back in, you know, the 90s. Like, I don't know. one I don't person know. figures it out. Yeah. But the, the point, the, the, the point I was making is, there's, there's a couple of reasons that you wouldn't want to use web crypto, and, it, and it's basically related to performance and, well, performance and performance. So in the general case, you should use web crypto. But if you find that web crypto is too slow for your use case, then you may need to drop down to node crypto. And specifically, that would be, say, for example, you need to encrypt an 8 gigabyte file or something that's more than a few megabytes you would need to drop down to node crypto to do that because web crypto, although the interface should basically accept any browser object for whatever reason, which this happens all the time in browser land if you ever go outside of the framework world, and even if you are in the framework world, you still have to deal with this. But the, you know, the different, because there's like five different bodies for web development. You know, there's the W3C and the WG and there's Winter CG and there's the JavaScript Foundation and the Node Foundation. Uh, you know, and they all kind of like create standards independently of each other and don't communicate at all. And so this is what happened with Web Crypto. We got um, UNT eight arrays in the browser, which is great, and Node has been using those for many, many years. Uh, but we also have streams in the browser because we have fetch. 
But when the streams were added for a bunch of the APIs like Fetch, they were not added to uh, the web crypto. And the Winter CG group is has a draft for adding. I mean, it's like it's, it's a primitive that already exists, but they they have like basically they're just drafting a spec that says, hey, you know that thing that we did with Fetch and the other stuff? Let's bring that to web crypto. So when that lands, you will never need to use, well, that's not entirely true. You will almost never need to use the uh, node stuff again. Another problem, though, is that with web crypto, it's always going to, and this could change in environments like node and bun, because they, they could optimize it away. But in web crypto, you're always leaving JavaScript land and then going down into C++ land, which causes a context switch, which causes memory to be moved, and the CPU thread to be activated outside of the event loop. Which, so if you wanted to do 800,000 hashes in JavaScript, it would take you uh, the you know four fifths of a second. If you wanted to do 800,000 hashes in Web Crypto, you might want to go get lunch and find a nice grave site. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's typically it's not a problem. But Web Crypto does have PBKDF2, and the PBKDF2 does all of the hashes down in C++. Then. So if you are using the PPKDF2 that's included in Web Crypto, it's only going to take the four fifths of a second. But if you were implementing something where you needed to hash a specific number of rounds because you were trying to, say, implement bcrypt on top of Web Crypto, then it probably wouldn't work out, and you'd have to go to Node Crypto to do that. Or was I'm just going to ask that, or could you implement it in Wasm? Bypass some of that? Maybe not all of it, but some of it. See, that, that's. Yeah, you would think, if that were the case, you would think they would have just implemented Web Crypto in Wasm. They did. They did. And it's ridiculously slow, so Wasm must still have the same context switch problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wasm is just a VM you run code on. If you are constantly, anything you're doing with Wasm, that you're constantly passing stuff back and forth, you will be slow and you'll be sad. Don't do that. <laughs> That's but, what it's just saying. But if you're not bound to the interface that Web Crypto provides you, you can just be like, here's some shit. Please do the 8,000, 800,000 rounds. Just let me know when you're done. And then it comes back in the, as a return from the function, and you're good. <laughs> so it just depends. He is right. The marshalling is still as slow as I'll get. Just don't marshal. I'm just glad that the crypto API has a UID generated. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I need. I'll let it deal with that. It's too bad yeah. that they are so late to the game and yet so late to the game again. Because UUIDs are so last February. <laughs> it's all about the ULIDs now. It just solves one of the problems with UUIDs. Uh, UUIDs because they, the, well UUID v4, which is what you get, and it is, it's purely random. And the problem with something that's purely random is that when you try to index on it, you can't keep any of the indexes in cache, and it causes cache thrashing on the indexes. So if you were to, like this is, it, it makes your writes. If you have a high write application, UUIDs will take your, your database write times down by like four to 10x, because it won't be able to keep any specific portion of the tree in memory for long enough to gain any of the advantages of it. ULIDs have a component that's monotonic, and they have a component, meaning time-based, and then they have a component that is random. So you get a partial timestamp, or maybe you get a full timestamp. I think actually it's 48 bits. I don't remember exactly. I don't remember the number of bits. I know there's a, the, the time part and the count part or, or the, the, the random part, and um, you can even just count the, the random part. 
Some, you somebody, do that. somebody wanted to use a couple of the bits for counting. I don't know if that actually is part of the spec or not, but that, but, but basically, yeah, the, you need sub millisecond resolution because you might generate more than one item <coughs> per millisecond. And, but it's got the random parts so it generally isn't problem. Mm -hmm. Somebody had a specific use case where that was, but they, so they were just going to use one of the bytes or something as a counter for how many times somebody could do that. But anyway, point is. It's got a counter and it's got a random part, which means that when you're doing database writes, it doesn't cache bust. It is a lot. It, it, it allows it to keep everything that is being cached as primary keys in the appropriate place in the tree, so that things can be written efficiently and then be read efficiently as well. It basically gives you the best of both worlds of a UUID and uh, incrementing counter ID. From both an indexing standpoint and an ordering standpoint, you can you can sort it. So 